unconscious and unresponsive with blood coming from the left ear. For nearly half a century, helicopters have been instrumental in saving lives due to their versatility and point-to-point -point speed. The survivability of trauma patients means that time is of the essence to most effectively utilize that critical golden hour. However, there is one factor that is more critical than time. That is the safe operation of the helicopter program. In this video, we will discuss operational and safety practices for the handling of helicopters at non-designated landing zones for the purpose of scene response. Utilizing helicopters for scene response requires consideration of distinct areas for planning and execution. These areas are preparation for arrival, arrival of the helicopter, ground operations, and departure. In the preparation stage, the important areas of consideration include the initial notification of the helicopter service and the actual selection and setup of the landing zone. Notification is usually the responsibility of the emergency medical service provider or law enforcement agency. The activation of the helicopter service should be considered any time an event occurs in which EMS or law enforcement believes that major indications for transport may be involved. You should familiarize yourself with the specific indications for the helicopter transport service that you typically utilize. However, some services may not accept patients due to safety and medical restrictions, which may include Patients contaminated with radioactive or other chemical materials unless they've been properly decontaminated. Patients that are violent, combative, or in custody unless they can be physically or chemically restrained. And patients that have CPR in progress. At the first indication that the helicopter service may be needed, it is important for the contacting agency to immediately relay the location of the scene so that the communication specialist can begin to plot latitude, longitude, direction and distance, and the pilots can perform the necessary weather checks in the event the weather is marginal. By doing this, valuable time is saved in the event the helicopter is ultimately needed. Upon confirmation by the contacting agency that the helicopter service is required, the helicopter will depart for the scene location. By this time, the contacting agency should have provided the communication specialist with the specific information required by that program. This information normally includes the number of patients, the approximate age of the patient, the mechanism of injury, if any hazmat operations are involved, and the radio frequency and identification of the LZ coordinator. Whenever possible, avoid the use of common frequencies and open PLs. This will keep radio interference to a minimum. Additional helpful information could include type of injuries, vital signs, and treatment initiated. If the contacting agency believes that more than one helicopter service will be needed, it is recommended that you allow the Helicopter Services Communication Center to coordinate this operation to avoid confusion and possible safety hazards. Preparation for the arrival of the helicopter service also includes the establishment of a safe landing zone. Critical to the setup of a safe and effective landing zone is the quick establishment of a trained landing zone coordinator. Only one individual should be delegated as the LZ coordinator. This individual should have the responsibility and authority to oversee and instruct the operations of all ground crews in accordance with their local helicopter services safety procedures. The LZ coordinator should also be the sole individual responsible for radio communications with a helicopter during arrival and departure. Here are the key items when considering a specific location as a landing zone. Its proximity to the scene and accessibility. The size of the landing zone the landing zone surface and degree of an existing slope, and any hazards in the landing vicinity. Although it is important to have the proximity of the LZ as close to the scene as possible, the LZ must allow for unrestricted accessibility, not only for the helicopter service, but for the ground crews as well. If the LZ coordinator determines that any surface restrictions such as fences, ditches, or soft ground will impede safe movement to and from the helicopter, another LZ should then be selected. Spilled fuel or broken glass can cause a significant safety hazard due to rotor wash and therefore the LZ should be established well clear of these or other material hazards. 
Most helicopter services require a landing area of approximately twice the length and twice the width of the specific helicopter being used. However, the area surrounding the landing zone should be as large as possible to allow the pilot's safe arrival and departure angles and room for maneuvering and avoiding obstacles. This is especially important for night operations. The surface of the landing area should be as firm and level as possible with a slope of no more than that specifically indicated by your local helicopter service. Paved lots or trimmed firm fields make the best landing surfaces. Common landing zone hazards include wires and poles, towers and trees. When surveying a landing zone for possible flight hazards, we suggest that the LZ coordinator use the 45 degree test. By standing in the middle of the LZ, the coordinator raises his arm to a 45 degree angle. Any objects that appear at or above his hand line presents an obstacle hazard to the pilot and they should be noted and reported. Additionally, for night operations, the entire landing area should be walked by ground personnel who raise and lower their lights to be sure there are no wire hazards in the LZ. The pilot should also be advised of significant surrounding features such as tall transmission towers and water tanks, not only as a safety precaution, but to help the pilots in locating the landing zone as well. When using a GPS to determine the coordinates of the LZ, it is important that the GPS unit is cleared before reading is taken and that the reading is obtained while standing in the middle of the landing zone, away from any obstructions. These coordinates should be obtained and relayed to the communication center as soon as possible so that the pilots can establish the most accurate course. GPS readings obtained from inside a vehicle or standing next to a vehicle or other obstruction will most likely be incorrect. A compass should be used to accurately orient the LZ coordinator and pilots to the setup of the LZ, as well as the direction of the wind. The actual setup of the landing zone should begin with the LZ coordinator issuing ground crew assignments. Emergency vehicles should be placed at the perimeter of the landing zone, as well as under any wires with their lights flashing. Determine whether the use of items such as flares, smoke, crime scene, or caution tape to mark the LZ are accepted practices by your helicopter service. The LZ coordinator or a person assigned by him should stand at the point of desired touchdown with their arms raised and with lighted wands at night. For night operations, the vehicles should be pointed towards the touchdown point, their headlights on high, so as to form an X with the center at the point of desired touchdown. If available vehicles are limited in number, two vehicles pointing their headlights into the wind towards the center of the LZ is acceptable. As many flashing lights as possible should be used to aid the pilots in locating the landing zone, especially at night. Although ground crews may be able to see the helicopter approaching from a considerable distance, ground clutter and conflicting residential lighting usually prevents the pilot from spotting the LZ until much closer in. If available, blue law enforcement lights are especially effective in helping to locate an LZ. The landing surface and surrounding area should also be inspected and cleared of any debris prior to the helicopter's arrival. If fire equipment and crews are provided, all personnel should be at the extreme perimeter of the LZ to allow for the helicopter's full use of the space available. Onlookers should be directed to stay well outside of the LZ perimeter, along with all ground personnel not assigned a specific task by the LZ coordinator. Clear and concise radio communication is critical to a safe and successful scene operation. The LZ coordinator will be the primary contact with the helicopter pilots and needs to relay a thorough description of the LZ, including size, surface, slope, wind direction, and any hazards that may be present. Try to use a vehicle-based radio whenever possible and don't offer any patient information until it is requested by the helicopter crew. Gilford County, Gilford County Unit 902, this is North Carolina by the Air Security Cop. This is Guilford 902, copy loud and clear. Uh, Roger, sir, good afternoon. We're about 10 minutes out from the LZ. You wonder if you had LZ information at this time, sir. Roger. You'll be landing in a, an industrial facility parking lot, a paved parking lot. Um, first hazard will be a light pole about 25 feet high. Uh, next will be a fire truck on the west side of the landing zone. Uh, there is a chain link fence to the south side of the landing zone. No power line hazards in the immediate area. Then you have a light pole on the east side of the landing zone and that's about it. It's a fairly open parking lot. It's been cleared of all debris and obstruction. The winds are from the north 
at about 15 miles an hour. After relaying this information to the satisfaction of the pilots, it is recommended that radio communications be kept to a minimum to allow the pilot and crew to concentrate on preparing for the approach and landing. Should the LZ coordinator make audio or visual contact with the helicopter, he should advise the pilots and issue any corrective action the pilot may need to take to find the LZ. All heading change suggestions should be made relative to the pilot's point of view. Occasionally, a landing zone may be changed when the helicopter is en route to the originally plotted LZ. It is important for the LZ coordinator to advise the pilots of the new LZ location relative to the original LZ and be prepared to provide the new GPS coordinates if requested by the pilot. The new landing zone will be a grassy area about a half mile east of the present location. We're currently setting up a landing zone. I'll have further information momentarily. When the helicopter arrives at the scene, the pilot will usually circle the landing zone for a pre-landing safety inspection. All personnel should be cleared out from within the full perimeter of the LZ. All vehicles should be completely secured. Whenever possible, the patient should be secured inside of an ambulance with the doors closed. The entire helicopter crew has specific responsibilities during this phase of flight, which is why radio communication should be avoided unless responding to a pilot's request or you spot a dangerous situation. When the helicopter has turned on to its final approach, the person marking the touchdown area of the LZ should leave the landing area. Ground crews should direct their attention not to the approaching helicopter, but to the perimeter of the LZ to maintain security. All protective clothing, hats, visors, chin straps, and gloves should be in place and secure. Here you see a number of hazards caused by not following the guidelines. First, the trooper is outside of the vehicle in close proximity to the landing area. His hat was not secure and was blown away by the rotor wash. He is positioned between an open door and the vehicle which could cause significant injury to himself as well as substantial damage to the vehicle or other persons or property if the door is dislodged. Another hazardous situation is allowing the patient to be in the LZ during helicopter operations. Once the helicopter has landed, the med crew will exit the aircraft. Upon exiting, they will proceed to the indicated location of the patient. It is not necessary for EMS, fire, or any other ground crews to approach the helicopter after landing, unless specifically directed by a flight crew member. And vehicles should never be allowed to operate anywhere within the perimeter of the LZ. The helicopter's tail rotor is extremely dangerous and can be difficult to see, and therefore must be avoided at all times. Any encounter with this component while it's turning will certainly be fatal. Assigned ground crews should continue to strictly enforce LZ security while keeping themselves well clear of the helicopter. For night landings, flashing lights, strobes, and high beams should be turned off when the helicopter nears the touchdown zone. Once the helicopter has landed and the crew begins to exit, searchlights that mark the path to the patient location are very helpful. Some helicopter programs will call another service provider to act on their behalf should they be busy or out of service. If this applies to your regular service provider, be aware that this may expose you to helicopter types and operating procedures significantly different from the helicopter and service you are accustomed to. Just remember that regardless of the helicopter type used, or whether it's a one or two pilot operation, all of the stated rules of landing zone security remain in effect, and it is absolutely critical that you do not approach the helicopter unless directed by a member of the flight crew. Upon landing and exiting of the aircraft, the helicopter services medical crew will assess and prepare the patient for flight. EMS or fire personnel will usually be designated by the medical crew to assist with the moving of the patient to the aircraft. Unless patient circumstances creates a prolonged ground time for the medical crew, the helicopter rotors will usually remain turning. This creates a number of safety issues that must be considered. Main rotor wash can cause loose debris, clothing, sheets, and any other unsecured material to be blown into ground personnel or the helicopter itself. And the helicopter's turbine engines are extremely loud and therefore make normal conversation between ground personnel nearly impossible. During loading under the direction of the helicopter crew, the patient will be taken to the aircraft. Notice that no objects, including IV bags, are held up in the air where they could be hit or blown away by the rotors. The patient is positioned at the helicopter for loading and then lifted into the aircraft. Specific ground personnel charged with moving the stretcher are also responsible for securing the sheet if provided. After the patient is in the aircraft, 
All assisting personnel should immediately move to a safe distance away from the aircraft, secure their equipment, and close all doors. The helicopter crew will take responsibility for securing the patient and the aircraft. For those helicopter programs capable of carrying more than one patient, the loading process should be nearly identical to the one patient scenario. It is important to note that all assisting ground personnel assigned to a particular patient leave the helicopter area once their patient has been loaded. Only those ground personnel assigned to the additional patient should assist in the loading of that patient. At no time should any ground personnel return to the aircraft unless specifically directed by the helicopter crew. When loading additional patients, it is often necessary to circle around the helicopter. This should only be done under the direction of the flight crew and in accordance with the specific procedures for the helicopter being used. Should the helicopter service be required to transport more than two patients, special procedures are involved for the setup of this operation. Just remember that you're never to approach the aircraft without explicit direction or approval from one of the flight crew. And once your specific task is accomplished, immediately leave the helicopter area. If two helicopters will be using the same LZ, the pilots will assume the primary responsibility for coordinating their operations. Ground crews should stay well clear of the landing area and watch for any unsafe ground movements. Helicopter ground operations with the doors open and crews in LZ will occur only when both helicopters are either on the ground or when one of the two aircraft has safely left the LZ. Patient transfer to the helicopter should always occur around the front and well clear of any other helicopter in the LZ. And all ground personnel should quickly leave the area and secure their equipment once the patient is loaded so that one or both of the helicopters can depart. During all scene operations, the LZ coordinator should enforce strict traffic control around the aircraft. Common landing zone security problems experienced by helicopter crews include family members of the victims at the scene, news crews, and onlookers who are not staying back the minimum distance specified by your particular helicopter service. If necessary, the LZ coordinator should appoint extra EMS and fire personnel to assist with landing zone security. During helicopter departures, it is critical that you confirm that the entire LZ area is secure, equipment is stored, and all doors are closed. Here you see a number of hazards caused by equipment remaining outside of the ambulance and the doors remaining open. For night departures, high beams and strobes should be left off. The flashing lights used to mark hazards should remain on. Do not attempt contact with a helicopter during departure unless a safety hazard is observed. The number one priority of any helicopter service is safety. Scene work is the area of operations where EMS helicopter programs are most exposed to unexpected hazards. By following the guidelines outlined in this video and specified by your particular helicopter service, you can be most effective at helping that service minimize the risk of scene response hazards.